for the past several weeks, we've been going through the book of Daniel. We're studying this idea of eternal hope, which is hugely important for us today. And the reason that it's such a valuable lesson for us is that the church is to be called as God's people to, to reflect a hope, not, not in the present and, and not even in the short-term future, which is where so many others, where I would say the majority of the world is focused our hope is different. You know, I've got a really good friend that, uh, that pastors a church in southern Ohio, and, and he says that he just, he's trying to live a life that, that will matter 10,000 years from now. And, that, and that's just a, a, a unique way of saying he's got a longer horizon than, than most. He, he's trying to do things that will, that will you know, not really matter in, in the short term, not really you know, make a big deal uh, as, as we move forward in the weeks or the months or the years, but you know, focused on things, on, on a hope, on, on a Lord, on a, on a God that has eternal significance for our lives. So today, uh, I just get to be open and honest with you. We are going to get to go through one of my favorite passages in all of Scripture. Uh, don't get me wrong, I hold to the idea of sola scriptura and tota scriptura, just like every other good Protestant out there. Uh, but from the very first time I read Daniel chapter 3, I've always been amazed at, at the drama, at, at the intensity, and at the faith that are on display here in these verses. Our sermon today is called Final Words of Faith. And, and the reason, I hope, will become apparent as we work our way through the text. You know, the, if you think about it, the idea of final words or someone's last words, th those are powerful, right? I mean, we may not know very much about Nathaniel Hale, but, but we do know that he regretted that he had but one life to give for his country, right? Because those were his final words. Uh, you know, someone in my own personal study and, and growth as, as I've kind of gone through seminary is uh, a man named J. Gresham Machen, who helped found Westminster Seminary in Philadelphia back in the 1920s. And, and what we know about him is that, you know, he died, I think, in Minnesota uh, while traveling over there and was kind of sick towards the end. But it's recorded that the last letter he ever wrote to a friend before dying ended with the words, I'm so thankful for the active obedience of Christ. No hope without it. And what I'm, what I'm trying to convey to each of us is that last words matter, both for the speaker, but often for the person who, who hears them, for the person who continues going on, even if that person uh, that, that spoke them is no longer alive. So when we study today that the final words or potential final words of, of some faithful men before an unstable king, we're going to see outstanding faith in an outstanding God, that there is a boldness, a clarity a confidence in the God that they proclaim. And, and so we just need to ask, okay, how does that translate to us? Why does this story even matter to us today? I think the short answer is we need to hear it. We, we struggle just like so many people that have come before us and that will come after us with, with the idea of being more comfortable understanding and proclaiming God's deliverance and his goodness, but only after the fact. We, we rejoice in deliverance after it happens, not before it does. And how do we get out of that struggle? How, how do we fight that, that natural human tendency? Well, our solution is going to be to remind ourselves time and time again of, of the basics of the gospel, to remember that deliverance for us, even here and now, is something that's already happened. It's something that's grounded in history itself. No matter what we face, God's people have been saved in an eternal matter by, by, uh, by the fact that Jesus lived, he died, and he rose again on their behalf. Now, surely, we need to understand deliverance from our present-day circumstances and how to engage in living in, in a broken and fallen world. And, 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 I mean, we understand that there will be another deliverance down the road when, when Jesus comes to rule and reign again. But as we start to think through that, that solution of remembering what Jesus has done for us, what are we to do with it? I mean, how should the truths we encounter today shape us on Tuesday morning or, or as we make it throughout the week? Well, I think the short answer is that we need to be comfortable in sharing our own testimonies, our own stories of faith, our own words of faith with whoever needs to hear them, regardless of the consequences that we might face. And we need to have confidence that our sovereign God will use it for his glory and for our goodness. Well, like I said, we're in Daniel chapter 3 this morning. We're going to do the whole chapter, verses 1 to 30. And so, as we've seen so far, the narrative or the, the two first chapters that we've encountered in Daniel have centered on the namesake of the book itself, Daniel, right? I mean, he's been one of the main characters. Uh, but I had someone, one, one of the leaders here at the church, text me a couple weeks ago and said, hey, I'm just reading through, and I was in Daniel 3, a silly question, where's Daniel? And that's a great question. He's not here in this narrative. 
Um, now, I think that there are a few reasons uh, that could make sense. Maybe he was just too high-ranking to, to be accused like his three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, were here. Or maybe he's so high-ranking that he's just been exempted from the king's royal decrees, and this is something that you know, kind of the lower people have to deal with. But, but honestly, I think the shortest and easiest answer is that he's probably just not physically present during the events of chapter 3. He was off somewhere else doing the king's business on his behalf. But either way, we're going to get to see that Daniel is not some one-off of a, of a super faith, a super person of faith in an otherwise lukewarm group of people. Rather, the faith that all of God's people have in him is seen as extraordinary to the rest of the world. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are proof that all of God's people have deep faith in being saved by their Redeemer because that's how they are God's people. So let's see the scenario that they face at the hands of Nebuchadnezzar, starting in verse 1 of chapter 3, reading from Daniel. It says, King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold, whose height was 60 cubits and its breadth 6 cubits. He set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then King Nebuchadnezzar sent to gather the satraps, the prefects, and the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. We're going to see a lot of repetitive language here. Then the satraps, the prefects, and the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces gathered for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And the herald proclaimed aloud, You are commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages, Another way of saying you, the whole world. That when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, you are to fall down and worship the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. Therefore, as soon as all the people heard the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, all the peoples, nations, and languages fell down and worshipped the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So this first section I'm calling Words of Idolatry. So, so as, right off the bat, as serious readers and students of the Bible, we always have to remind ourselves of exactly where we find ourselves in the text. What is the context of what we're reading? And, and this is a great example why. When you read the words of an image of gold, that should instantly trigger in your brains a flashback to what we studied last week. Nebuchadnezzar had had a dream of this large and magnificent metal, uh, metal image made of, uh, of gold that represented him, which was struck and shattered on an otherwise ordinary stone. What we know was a foreshadow of the cornerstone of Jesus Christ himself. And although there seems to be a bit of, of a positive resolution at the end of chapter 2, it seems like he worships, worships slightly correctly, we now see it, it almost feels like he's going in the complete opposite direction. He's going the wrong way. Now again, it's good to remind ourselves that the events of the book of Daniel span anywhere from 50 to 70 years. There, there's a lot of time in these chapters. And so, you know, th there could have been a space of days, months, or even years between the events of chapter 1 and ch or chapter 2 and chapter 3. But either way, Neb Nebuchadnezzar is showing some of the same stability issues, or some might even call it struggles with sanity, that plagued him in chapter 2. He's turning around and using the very thing that should have warned him to not worship himself and, and to worship God. He's, he's actually using it as a way to, again, point to himself and worship himself. And as an extra measure that should, should horrify the reader, you know, we see that the very furnace that, that is going to destroy or that is meant to be the, the method of execution for anyone that doesn't bow down it is very likely the, the very tool that was used to build this image in the first place. That's meant to be drastic and shocking to us as readers. But there's, there's something even more concerning, I think, for, for the careful biblical reader here. Look at our location, our physical location and see what it, what it calls. I think in verse 2 it says that we are located in the plain of Dura. And if that sounds familiar, or it's actually a, another name for, for a very similar area to uh, something we've actually seen already here in Daniel. In Daniel 1, verse 2, we also hear the term the plain of Shinar. But that's not the first time we've heard the plain of Shinar. Uh, if you go all the way back to Genesis chapter 11, verse 2, 
we see that that is the physical location for that chapter. Does anyone remember what happens in Genesis 11? That is the failed construction of the Tower of Babel. So what does that mean? Either, either with a great tower or with a statue that's 90 feet tall, that this is the, a place where humanity has tried multiple times now to climb up and proclaim its own glory to the rest of the world. One of my favorite scholars is a professor in Kansas City named Matthew Barrett, and, and he wrote uh, the following when talking about man's basic need for redemption because of man's tendency to, to be a, a theologian of glory, to, to be a self glorifying theologian. He says this, from Adam to Cain, from the flood to Babel, and from Sodom to Israel's exile, the history of humanity can be summed up, in, summed up concisely. In Adam, man strives to justify himself. Theologians of glory, self-glory, to borrow the, the phrase from Martin Luther, will always build a tower into the heavens as if they can climb their way up into glory and claim the throne of the one who made them we're seeing a repeat of the very same mistakes we saw at the beginning of Scripture. And the result is going to be no better here, and it would be no better if we attempt it again in our own day. Think about it. Our minds are naturally drawn to, to amazement at, at the creation of massive structures or, or tall buildings or, or wonderful feats of engineering. But if those become arenas for us to just glorify ourselves and what we are able to create, guess what? They're going to be empty echo chambers of our own vanity. And it's, it's easy to read a passage like this and say, look, look how over the top and gross and blatant this idolatry is. Of course, we would never fall for something like this, right? And while it's true, we do not have any 90-foot statues outside that we have to go worship before we come in here so we are allowed to worship our God, I think it's important for us to, to consider whether or not we, we have the seeds of such self-worship growing within our own hearts. You know, we, we could do this individually or we could do this at a corporate level, I'll use myself as an example here. You know, my wife and I, we have two young kiddos, which means we're now on like the opposite side of discipline for the first time. We're learning what that side looks like. Uh, and so often when we have to correct or, you know, discipline uh, or even punish our children for, for certain behavior, I need to always ask myself through the lens, did, did I do that because they needed to learn good behavior for their own flourishing, for their own growth and, and, and maturity? Or was it just because my personal dad kingdom was somehow threatened? You know, it's so easy in the moment to think that I'm doing the, the former, but deep down it's usually the latter that drives us to interact with, with our children, with our spouses, with our coworkers, with our friends or family members in harsh ways. We, we like to lash out when we feel attacked or disrespected or threatened. And it's not, it's not just there, but anywhere in, our, in our, uh, any other parts of our personal or in our corporate lives. We as God's people need to be willing to examine if we're pursuing God's glory with everything we've got, or if there's a little corner of our lives or even of our churches that we want to be our own platform, our own calling card, our own image of greatness to proclaim to the rest of the world. So often we see this manifest in, you know, we've got our theology right, or, or we've got our church planting model down, or, or we're doing the, the proper observation of, of a certain doctrine or, or a certain uh, implication, or we just really serve and love the community well. All of these ways are, are, are to just, again, make our calling card about us and not about the God that we worship. And if so, we need to read these words of idolatry and be reminded of just how gross and, and, and ugly and hideous it can be on the outside looking in and how much we need true words of worship to, to replace them, to, to make our hearts, again, focus on our God, not on ourselves. So that's our first section. And, and the first section is called Words of Idolatry, which is not a very fun one. I can promise that the next three sections are actually uh, a little bit uh, easier to, to, to swallow. So the, the next one, the next section from verses 8 to 18, I'm calling Words of Testimony. Words of testimony. Let's start reading and working our way through this text. Therefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came forward and maliciously accused the Jews. They declared to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that every man who hears the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into a burning, fiery furnace." There are certain Jews from whom you have appointed over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, pay no attention to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. 
This is just a quick side note, but do you notice that so-called accusation or, or insult that we see in verse 12? That's actually a compliment to people who worship God. I mean, look at it. They're saying, look how unfocused they are on us, on our idols, on our gods. And they're, and they're starting to ask, like, well, what in the world could be so distracting to them? What, what are they focusing on other than us? And let's see how Nebuchadnezzar responds. In verse 13, it says, Then Nebuchadnezzar, in furious rage, so he's not responding well, commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought. So they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said to them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up? Now, if you are ready, when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, to fall down and worship the image that I have made, well and good. But if you do not worship, you shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. Here's an important part. And who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? This brings us to the crux of the matter. Who is your God? I know that, again, at a lightning quick pace reading through this, it seems like Nebuchadnezzar has completely forgotten about the very same God that he encountered in chapter 2. But, but again, it's probably been some time between chapter 2 and chapter 3, and, and we need to remember his context. He's, he's ruling over a polytheistic, pluralistic society. Many gods, many nations, many cultures. I mean, it kind of sounds familiar to our situation today, right? So it's not unreasonable to think that, you know, he, he might be thinking these three worship a different god than Daniel did. Or maybe he's saying, do they have a, a bigger and better better and, and badder God that I need to wor uh, worship so I can be attached to him for the benefit of myself and my kingdom? I mean, there, but that's, that's a little bit of a side note. I would also say there seems to be a whiff of desperation here. This, this, you know, this idea of using the strongest threat possible before asking the basic question within his heart. He's using the might of the empire and its infamous torture method to ask one of the basic questions all of humanity has. Is there a God? Who is he? What is our relationship to him? Can I be saved by this God? But if that's the crux, this brings us to what I call the hinge of the passage, verses 16 to 18. The sermon itself is called the final words of faith. And what we see here that these words, those final words, are testimony. The terrifying method of execution before them is the furnace which forged the image in the first place. So these three friends have the horror of not only being martyred for their faith, but their bodies feeding the very machine which gave birth to this idol in the first place. This is meant to be horrifying and terror-inducing. And with that context in mind, let's read in verse 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. This is important. But if not, but if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. It again I've said this many times in the series already. I'm, I'm struck by the respect and restraint these three friends show towards Nebuchadnezzar. You know, it'd be easy in our age to say, just call him a heretic, call him a pagan worshiper, and, and go die a valiant death. But, but look, while never sacrificing their ability to, to speak respectfully to a person whom God has placed over them in a position of rule, they maintain a respectful atti attitude that does not skew their final words. You know, it gives clarity to those last moments so that they are more clearly remembered. You know, in, in a world, world then and a world now that is just obsessed with avoiding death and living as long as possible, we never cease to be amazed by those who face death itself with a resolute calm and, and, and demeanor in, in something greater than what they faced before them. But I think this is as good a place as any to ask a basic question when reading and interpreting our Bibles. And the question I always like to ask is, how thick are their Bibles at this point? You know, we, we are so used to reading this, this idea, that this story, this narrative, comfortable in the idea that there's going to be a chapter 4 to Daniel, and that there's going to be a remainder of the Old Testament, and there's going to be an entire New Testament that helps us make this entire story weave together. We'll be able to make sense of this, right? But for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, this is it. There's nothing beyond that, at least from an earthly perspective. For all they know, there's nothing, for, there's nothing further to their story here on earth. 
And yet, how is it they respond? They testify to their faith that the living God is able and has ability to deliver them because they know that they've already been delivered by being his people. This is huge. Do not, however, confuse ability with obligation. The phrase, but if not, is incredibly important to every son and daughter of the living God. When, when we speak of God redeeming a person, we're speaking first and foremost of an eternal salvation from sin and separation and punishment and salvation into a restored and beautiful relationship with our creator, covenant God, for all eternity. But that redemption does not somehow require or force God to also redeem us from the difficulties of living in a world that suffers from the effects of the fall. In fact, we're told that even if it isn't as as extreme as what we see in this text, that our likeliest path while still alive as God's people is one of suffering. Not triumph, not glory, not, not success, not wealth, not fame, but suffering. I listened to a great sermon a couple years ago, uh, preached out of 2 Timothy by a pastor I respect out of Denver named Gary McQuinn, and he preached a line that has always stuck to me from this. The, if you haven't read it, the book of 2 Timothy is, is full of this idea of living faithfully while suffering. He said the following, The normal path of discipleship for the majority of followers of Christ is this, suffer, 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 die, glory. That's the path And that's beautiful. Again, you and I are comfortable reading this story because we know how it ends. But that isn't the case for all of God's people. Not everyone ends up like this. Not everyone ends up like Martin Luther, who had his infamous here I stand moment and then got to go live a long life of of, of reforming the church and writing books that we still love to cite today. If you want proof, let me offer you the name of Helen Stierke. I hope I get the pronunciation right. She she isn't famous, even in our small subset of Reformed Christianity, but Helen Stierke was was a Scottish housewife and a mother whose major sin in the 1600s was simply refusing to pray, as, as custom was, refusing to pray to the Virgin Mary while in the pains of childbirth. What she said, man, I wish I had this bravery. She said that praying to anyone other than God was superstitious insurance for our minds. Then... When, when they were questioned, when, when the idea was further pursued, she and her husband were eventually found out to be Protestants. And in a highly Catholic part of the world, the local church and the local government there branded them as heretics. Uh, and and I, I wish there was a better ending, but they were executed for their beliefs. They were martyred for their faith. She was not delivered from an earthly fate, but even her last words, her final words, were those of testimony, were those of a faith in a greater God. She looked at her husband. He, he was executed first. And she said, husband, be glad. For we have lived together many joyful days, and this day in which we must die, we ought to esteem the most joyful of all, because we shall have joy forever. Therefore, I will not bid you good night, for we shall meet again shortly in the kingdom of heaven. When I start to think about how this applies in our own life, or in our own day, I have to offer the following precaution. The outstanding majority of us will not face a literal furnace or something that Helen Stierke had to face for her faith. And and honestly, it's a little irresponsible to use hyperbolic language that we are facing something exactly like they are. We're called to be sober-minded in how we understand and engage with culture, which means the version of aggression we'll face to our faith is likely intellectual, relational, or or cultural. We just won't be as as popular or as well-liked for our views on on life and, and living in a way that honors God. But with that said, we need to ask, when we face questions or with why we don't go along with the cultural moment of the day, are we as ready as these three here or as Helen Stierke was before us to, to testify and confess that our faith in the living God is our guide? Are our lives and our words of testimony so God-focused that it forces others like Nebuchadnezzar to ask, who is your God? And even if the words we speak, the last words we speak are not in front of a literal furnace, but maybe the last words we speak in a relationship that's going to fracture on the cornerstone of Jesus, or or, or maybe the last time an acquaintance or someone just hears a brief word from us, my prayer is that they are like these. They, They are final words of faith, a powerful testimony to the living God who can deliver us from anything because we know that he has already delivered us from everything. So that's where we are a little over halfway through the text. 
And this is a powerful moment. I, I think it's fair to say Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego hoped that their testimony would be enough to call off the persecution, allow the crowd to go on home, and, and everyone would you know, be happy by the end of the evening, right? But the reason this story is so powerful is because it goes on. And, and, and they are not spared from Nebuchadnezzar's attempt to, to make an example of this relig- religious movement that does not go along with his idea, his flow, right? Let's read what happens in verse 19. Then Nebuchadnezzar was filled with fury, and the expression of his face was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He ordered the furnace heated seven times more than it was usually heated, and he ordered some of the mighty men of his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and to cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their cloaks, their tunics, their hats, and their other garments, and they were thrown into the burning, fiery furnace. Because the king's order was urgent and the furnace overheated, the flame of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell bound into the burning, fiery furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and rose up in haste. He declared to his counselors, Did we not cast three men bound into the fire? They answered and said to the king, True, O king. He answered and said, But I see four men unbound, walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt. And the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. So we'll get to the bigger part towards the end. But but look at first at what happens to those who are supposed to accompany the three Israelites to their deaths. It's important to see that they suffered the fate meant for the Jews. But because of the king's haste, they were the ones who were killed, not the other way around. You know, just like a small kind of side theme of chapter 2 was this contest between God's ability and the Babylonian deity's ability to interpret or make known unknowable dreams, we, we have here a contest of who can better protect his people, the living God or Nebuchadnezzar himself. And we see that the king fails miserably here. His men die merely attempting to kill the others. It's just another way to highlight the power of deliverance found at the hand of God instead of anywhere else, instead of in any human hands. But the fact that they are not destroyed in the fire, while others are, I think reflects another deeper biblical idea. This idea of of purification by fire that that, that purifies and reveals beauty rather than destroys it. Uh, It was great that Tristan read from 1 Peter, because I'm going to do the same, uh, just in chapter 1. Peter was very familiar with this, this idea and knew the importance of this story to, to the Jews. So when he wrote his letter, he had this in mind in 1 Peter 1, 6. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So what, is, what does this imagery mean? Well, let's play it out a little bit further. When gold goes through the fire that forms it, when it was first forged in these ancient days, it rarely was completely pure when it first began. There, there was you know, probably rocks or, or other, other metals or you know, just dirt that needed to be removed from this. So during the process of cranking up the heat and melting this gold down, the gold and any impurities, which is often called dross, would separate. And so when the dross was removed and the gold cooled down, you had a, a pure precious metal that you could work with. And what Peter says in his passage is what is proven in our passage, that in the literal fire of a furnace, there is nothing left to rely on but faith in the deliverance of God. There's no hope in your own ability or your own creativity to try to find a way out of this. You can't talk your way out of a furnace. And yet because of the faith we already know that they have by way of their words of testimony, they are preserved. So the question Kind of the the application as we think through this is, do we have any dross that we carry in our own lives, things that needs to be removed by a fire of of trial? What about us as a a church? And and I'm not just meaning as a local congregation. I'm talking about the the capital C, the the global church. I think so. I I think there's been a process of that removing. I've used the language of sifting for a while, but this purification and removal of dross applies, especially in the last couple of years, right? You know, I heard a sociologist say that the the pandemic simply accelerated trends in our society by about 10 years in the last 18 months or so. And I think that's true. I think that applies to the church as well. Don't get me wrong. It's important for churches to think through deeply and, and biblically about programs and classes and events 
that enable them to serve the community they're in or, or to have a presence or be known among the people that they have been planted. But so many times, people grow more comfortable in the peripheral things around a church rather than the basic things that make a church in the first place. And when those, those peripheral things are suddenly taken away and we, we literally cannot do them for a season, guess what? Churches have to go back to the very basics of preaching the word, of, of administering the sacraments, of, of praying, of, of caring and, and loving for one another. Guess what? Church membership is going to be a lot less enticing, a lot less, some, a lot less something that you know, want, we want to be a part of. And I think evangelical churches especially that are more simplistic in worship and liturgy and their method of studying the Bible, they're going to lose people when, when the fire of, of a global pandemic comes through and the fun is kind of stripped away and we realize, oh, we're, we're a people of the Word, spending time in the Word, praising God with the Word, and, and growing in our relationship with Him. But in that fire, a certain purity comes as well. Our churches may be smaller. The church I work at is, is smaller than it was two years ago. But guess what? I think they're healthier. There may be fewer faces, but I think there's more devotion in the seat. There may be smaller budgets, but there's more of giving of each other in all aspects of life. This is a hard thing. I don't want to deny that it's been a hard season for so many churches in our area, around the world, wherever they might be. But guess what? It's also a good thing for God's people to look around and know who their brothers and sisters are and say, okay, Let's keep going, arm in arm, together after the only thing we have and the only thing we need in common, our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. But as one reminder, we're not alone in that fire. God will not abandon us at, at our moment of trial and temptation. L look at what happens next. A fourth person, someone else, appears within the furnace. Now, some people believe that this is the angel of the Lord, some believe that this is a pre-New Testament appearance of Jesus. I, I lean slightly towards the, the Jesus idea. But, but either way, I, I think it's a human manifestation of the saving presence of a divine God. And in this supposed torture device, guess what? God's people get to see what real love and real glory and real deliverance look like. They're not left, uh, they're not left to their own thoughts of whether or not God will save them. And guess what? What happened to them here is promised to each and every one of us as well. In Isaiah 43, the prophet writes, But now thus says the Lord, He who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name, you are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. Rather than wondering if we will make it through the fire, let us remember that God is the one who is always with us, who will not abandon his people. He is with us in every moment of our lives. I mean, his spirit literally indwells. It lives within us this very moment. So in the midst of trials, don't worry about what if, but instead focus on the, the, the knowns, the things that we understand of God himself, his goodness, his promises, his salvation, his love, his presence among his people. And as we start to do that, we'll reflect the presence of God, which should inspire words of wonder both among us and among those who see us and witness God's people praising him. So that brings us to our last section, our last series of words today. This final section I'm calling Words of Praise. And this section of the passage is really straightforward. When properly experienced, the presence of God and his salvation should result in praise and worship to God. Let's read in verse 26. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the door of the burning fiery furnace. He declared, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God. Sounds a little better than the last couple times. Uh, come out and come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out from the fire, and the satraps, the prefects, the governors, and the king's counselors gathered together and saw that the fire had not had any power over the bodies of those men. The hair of their heads was not singed, their cloaks were not harmed, and no smell of fire had come upon them. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him. And set aside the king's command and yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any god except their own god. 
Therefore, I make a decree, any people, nation, or language that speaks anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn limb from limb, and their houses laid in ruins, for there is no other God who is able to rescue in this way. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. So that phrase in verse 27, the fire had not had any power over the bodies of those men, that's meant to make us ask, okay, well, exactly who had power over the bodies of these men? So, uh, of course, we know, and, and now everyone in this story knows that it is the God they testified about before they went into the furnace. This is a definitive answer to the question that plagued Nebuchadnezzar in the beginning. Who exactly is this God, and can he save you? And to make sure that the answer is a clear yes, to make sure that the salvation and the understanding of it was complete and total, there was no damage to their clothes, and, and their hair was left uncinched. There's no smell of smoke. There's no physical evidence remaining of the fact that they are the subject of a failed execution. They have been completely saved, and the king who witnesses it responds in worship. Of course, he did something similar last week after Daniel interpreted the dream, and, and he got some things very, very wrong. You know, he praised Daniel instead of his God, but look, we see improvement from then to now. Rather than worshiping Daniel or now the three Israelites here, he now offers praises to their God. The glory of, of the God who saves is now being proclaimed by the highest office in the land, by a foreign ruler. Think about that. That gives us maybe a small glimmer of insight into the why of the exile. You know, of course, the primary reason is is punishment for Judah's continued temptations and, and failures and, and flirtations with other idols of other nations. But a secondary purpose is that the name of God is called upon in foreign lands by foreign kings. Part of the exile's purpose is mission. It's God's mission here on earth. God is sovereignly, purposefully working among the nations for his own name, his own glory, and his own purpose, not our own. So when I started thinking of, of properly experiencing God and how that should result in spontaneous or uncontrollable worship, I, had, I have to be honest, I struggled with, to think through of how to, how to best illustrate this. I remember it was Tuesday afternoon of this week. I, I was driving home. I got home, walking inside. And I was like, man, I, I don't know what this looks like. And then I got to turn the corner and my daughter got to see me. So if you haven't seen her, I think she's pretty cute. Uh, but we're in this magical season between a little two-year-old girl and her dad where I walk into a room, and you know, if I haven't been there for a few hours or whatever, she'll, she'll, and she hasn't seen me. She, when she finally sees me, she kind of gasps and, and like scrunches up, her face scrunches a little bit, and then she just runs and grabs my leg. So I have to admit, it's, it's awesome. And I think it's safe to assume that that will clearly happen for the rest of our lives. Uh, that will never change. But just in case, just in the off chance that this is a season of this, uh, I'm enjoying every moment of it. I, I delight in those quick hugs and cuddles and hearing her say, I love you, daddy. It is honestly, it's the best. But think about it. If me being a dad to my children is a small image, a small reflection of the relationship our God, our father has with his own children, imagine how much greater his joy is when we experience his presence and respond in worship with our whole being. When we offer all of ourselves to him to honor him. When we cling to him and say, I love you, father. There's nothing better than to be in your presence. I don't want to be anywhere else. I don't presume to know the mind of God, but you've got to think he loves that. Hearing from the children that he created and loved and redeemed from sin and death, and he probably loves that more than we could ever imagine. It's good for us to love God, and he delights in us in, in experiencing that goodness. He wants to see us experience his presence and his love. And so the way we, we put this into practice today, here and now, is simple. We're to be a worshipful people. Not just with an hour or two of our time on Sunday mornings or those, those few minutes where we remember to, to grace God with our presence by reading his word or maybe saying a quick prayer during the day, but, but with everything we have. You know, we, we're to worship him with our entire being. Don't hold anything back. Look, look at how Nebuchadnezzar speaks of the three Jews here. He is in awe of them because, because they did what? because they yielded up their own bodies rather than serve and worship any other God than their own God. Romans 12.1 tells us to do the exact same thing. After learning about God and his magnificent salvation found in Christ, what does Paul say? He says, we are to present our, our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is our spiritual worship. 
We give everything to God in worship because he gave everything to us in love. We don't hold anything back in showing our devotion to the Lord because he didn't hold anything back when it came to saving us. I go back time and time again to the question found in the Heidelberg Catechism that asks what the chief end of man is. And I answer gladly, to glorify God and enjoy him forever. We give him our everything. And if there are ever words or or thoughts that are spoken or thought of God's people, I, I hope, I pray that they are words of wonder, words of praise, words of worship. So I began this morning by being honest with you and saying that today is one of my favorite passages in all of Scripture. And I think part of that is that I'm a planner, you know, and whenever thinking through a situation, I'm always the guy filled with the questions of, but what if this happens? You know, how do we handle this unknown? If things don't go according to plan, then what do we do? And in the midst of my heart's desire for certainty, the truth found within all of Scripture, and especially within Daniel 3, verses 17 and 18, it comes back to me time and time again. God's got control of everything that, I, that I'm worried about. And sure, he's able to work things out for, for my temporary benefit for, or for my good in the short run, but, but even not, You know, if I or if you or if we face persecution, rejection, or or ridicule for something we believe, or even face something that might require our lives, we're still called to worship our God. We're still called to praise Him with every word and every deed. Let the last words people hear from us be words that testify to the goodness and, and the mercy of our Savior and what He has done for us at the cross. God delivered these three from execution, but do you know who He didn't stop? His son. Jesus pleaded for another way, but ultimately submitted to the Father's will and went to the cross to bear your sins, to bear my sins, to bear the wrath of God that was meant for us. And because we know that God took our salvation and redemption from sin so seriously, we know that he can deliver us from anything else that the world with all of its lusts and idols and glories tries to throw our way. But even if he doesn't, guess what? He's already given us Jesus. And, and that's more than enough to give him our devotion, our praise, our love, our worship.